Great. So today we are going to look at architecture of the 18th century um, Europe. And uh, 18th century is known as the um, age of enlightenment. Uh, what is enlightenment? Um, 18th century is, is very important, uh, known as the age of enlightenment. Um, it's also the time uh, when industrial revolution started uh, in the 18th century. And the 18th century in architecture is also characterized by a new returning to classicism. Um, you know, after the Baroque, um, the Baroque reaction and um, classicism re was revived again. Um, so there is a Renaissance uh, classic, classical revival, and then there is a Baroque reaction to that, you know, kind of returning to medievalism, a reaction to classicism, and then 18th century uh, classicism uh, revived again. Uh, so there's this kind of back and forth struggle. And we will look into a historical background and see why that happened. And um, um, and it is happening um, also during great scientific engineering uh, advancement uh, and uh, accompanying the accumulation of knowledge as well as the um, great development of uh, industry. So what is enlightenment? Um, uh, Immanuel Kant um, had talked about enlightenment and um, he was one of the key figures giving definition to enlightenment. I'm not going to read this passage. Um, his main argument is being enlightened means you are using your own, um, you are using your own rational thinking. Uh, you are using Instead of going uh, to those divine authority like the Bible, uh, you resort to your own rational thinking, uh, rely on your own empirical experience to find the truth, to find the knowledge. And his famous saying is sapera audi. Um, that is dare to know. So one needs to to um, to dare to be trusting one's own judgment, one's own um, you know rational thinking, one's one's own reason. And for Kant, eighteenth century was not an enlightened age yet but was well on the way to enlightenment. So he said, do we presently live in an enlightened age? Uh, the answer is no, but we do live in an age of enlightenment. So 18th century um, was a century with uh, great uh, proliferation of, of knowledge. And that knowledge was based on reason rather than faith. And throughout the 18th century, um, those intellectuals, and we will see that in architecture as well. Um, so if Bible is not the only source for truth, then what is? Uh, for a lot of 18th century intellectuals, philosophers, it is nature. By studying nature, by studying, observing what is surrounding us, in nature, including human and human society, um, that is the source of knowledge. Um, so, and using one's reason to know, instead of going to the high authority of the Bible to acquire truth. So there is a higher emphasis on empirical knowledge versus, uh, 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 instead of those ontological um, kind of 
speculation uh, about truth. And that, that is, of course, partially a result of great scientific discovery made in the previous 17th century. Um, in 1687, uh, toward the end of the 17th century, uh, Isaac Newton published his Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. So we call it natural philosophy. Today we call it physics, right? Physics. It is a knowledge acquired by careful analysis and careful observation of nature. So the nature became a great source of knowledge. And it is the, you know, if not replacing Bible as the sole authority uh, for truth, at least it provided a very powerful source for origin of knowledge. So there was great scientific discovery in the 17th century that had impact on the 18th century direction of philosophy and thinking. So throughout the 18th century, knowledge had been accumulated and those are mostly uh, empirical knowledge based on the observation of nature. And great philosophers of the century accumulate those knowledge and classify those knowledge into different categories and that make eventually what became known as encyclopedia. Uh, encyclopedia compilation started in the 18th century and that is the result of a new form of knowledge and a new faith in those empirical knowledge as a result of scientific discovery. And that emphasis on nature and on imperial knowledge, on reason, on rational thinking, directly um, give result to the great engineering um, advancement. And that is the um, industrial revolution, right? So 17th century, great scientific discovery, 18th century, great engineering, kind of application of those scientific di discovery uh, in um, the way um, energy are being, um, you know, tamed and, uh, uh, you know, put it, it put into uh, industry. So um, 1775, what uh, invented or improved the steam engine and that was the base for industrialization uh, in the eight, late 18th, 18th century, and uh, then 19th century really um, bear the fruit for that industrial revolution. So in the 19th century, we will see those um, industrial influence of industrial revolution on architecture. So these are, these are all kind of connected, right? So there's a scientific um, line, scientific, through rational thinking and in architecture, it is resulted in more humanistic aspect and returning to classicism again in architecture. And then there is a technological line that resulted in industrial revolution and uh, that gave people new vision and was resulted in the fact of Can someone tell me uh, where did you lose me? Um, like three minutes ago. Okay. You can, um, I emailed you, Professor. You can just disregard the email. It was just telling you that you lied. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, um, all right. So, so in the early 18th century, uh, we already start to see um, the emphasis on rational thinking in architectural design. For example, um, the Reformation Church um, <clears throat> emphasized the acoustic and the visual quality of the preaching instead of the, those uh, mysterious uh, rituals in the Catholic uh, church and cathedral. 
for example, okay. in this you, building. You're not um, sharing your screen. I don't oh, know if you. I see. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I forgot that. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, um, so this is the famous some marking in the fields. Uh, you might have heard of uh, Nerval Mariner, right? Nerval, Nerval Mariner conducting the um, uh, some marking in the field, the Philhar Philharmonic. Um, so, so this some marking in the field was originally a church, uh, Reformation church designed by James Gibbs in the 18th century. And um, um, so for the Reformation ch church, um, the church space is a space for lecture, basically, not a space for ritual. So it, is, it was designed for good acoustic and a visual quality. Everyone in the audience was able to see the preacher and everyone can hear um, what um, the preacher is preaching. So it's not very hard to convert such Reformation church into a symphony hall. And today it is a symphony hall. And it is not accidental because these Reformation church uh, in, the, in, the, in the early uh, 17th century was already highlighting these rational thinking in architectural design. Um, in its exterior image, it is not very different from the for example, not, not, not that different from um, a church by Christopher Wren, um, although this one, it is, it is occupying an empty lot, so it, it can afford having all the facade being designed, but you know, the combination of entrance with uh, the bell tower um, using classical motif, it is, and using some Baroque motif in the, um, um, in the pinnacle. Um, it's all basically following Christopher Wren uh, style, but there is a you know greater highlight on uh, acoustic and a visual quality in the interior. Um, and uh, another kind of field of study that was initiated um, is the archaeology. Arche scientific archaeology started in the 18th century. You know, in the beginning of this course, we talked about Arthur Evans, we talked about uh, Schliemann, uh, Heinrich Schliemann, and those were, you know, all 18th century archaeologists who started excavation to discover truth. Archaeology is to trying to find the truth about the past by observation, by imperial empirical um, exploration of those natural remaining from the class, from the past, right? So um, archeological discovery had informed 18th century architect with new set of knowledge for classical revival, right? So classical archeology span contributed to neoclassicism in the 18th century and 18th century classicism is different from the Renaissance revival of classical past in the dimension that it was trying to revive the classical past based on, based on scientific discovery, based on scientific knowledge acquired from archeology. span So some buildings, um, designed neo, in the neoclassical style in the 18th century um, include uh, the, the buildings uh, posted here. For example, the, um, the Kenwood house designed by Robert Adam. And Robert Adam um, is an English architect in the 18th century, famous for his neoclassical design based on scientific knowledge. And um, um, same is James Stewart, uh, who designed this Doric portico in the Hagley Park in England. And this um, Hagley Park was based on the scientific 
knowledge about uh, Roman temple. So it, it used those, those, you know, Roman facade and used that kind of a uh, pro, st uh, pro style uh, instead of peristyle. And all those are more kind of archeologically cracked um, uh, compared to the Renaissance revival. So the, you can find a prototype you, and their measurement was trying to be uh, truthful to those uh, archaeological discovery. Um, and uh, archaeological discovery directly informed architect like Robert Adams uh, in the interior design as well. For example, in uh, Austerley Park House, um, for which Robert Adams uh, designed the interior, the exterior was completed by an unknown architect in the 16th century. However, when Robert Adam was hired to uh, do the interior design in the 18th century, he designed each interior room following um, a specific classical style. And, uh, and those classical style was based on the recent discovery and excavation of Pompeii and the excavation of Pompeii uh, classified those classical wall painting into different style. And here, one of the uh, interior, um, he, he called it the Etruscan room, which is actually based on uh, uh, some, uh, one of the many, many um, uh, kind of a mural styles uh, discovered in, in Pompeii. And uh, so you can find in Pompeii, some of the wall painting that looks very similar to that uh, with the very delicate, um, delicate kind of architectural motif decorating the walls. So there is a scientific knowledge behind the classical revival in the 18th century. And another direction um, of 18th century architecture the revival, classical revival, is continuing the Renaissance uh, revival, um, but uh, kind of combined with kind of a new knowledge about um, the classical past. Uh, Palladianism was very popular in the 18th century. So there were a lot of um, buildings based on the publication of Palladio's four books on architecture and multiple buildings mimicking Villa Rotunda had been built in the 18th century, include uh, Richard Boyle's and uh, William Kent's uh, Chiswick House um, that is clearly um, kind of mimicking um, the Villa Rotunda. Um, but here, you know, he added something that is reflecting the 18th century new knowledge about Roman architecture. For example, he added that those window and that window um, is, you know, usually used in the Roman bath, um, the Roman uh, Roman bath window, and uh, he put it on the on the drum, and then um, some kind of a, you know, Renaissance um, heritage. Um, such as you know, capping the window with a small pediment um, is a kind of a um, Renaissance heritage. Um, and uh, Thomas Jefferson's famous Monticello, uh, Jefferson uh, was a also um, a, an amateur architect, but he uh, admired classical past and his design was also heavily influenced by the um, by Palladianism and Palladio's publication. So here we can again clearly see the connection and some Roman windows were also added to to the drum as well as the as the pediment. Um, another great event in the 18th century um, was the Greek independence. You know, Greek had been a Ottoman Turkish province since the 16th century. And um, um, 
by the 18th century, um, Greece um, was fighting for its independence, uh, was trying to be to, to get independent. And 18th century, a lot of 18th century uh, uh, intellectuals like the poet Baron um, had been advocating uh, for Greek independence. And some of them went to Greece to fight the, the Turks and uh, some of them died there. So 18th century Greece as the origin of classic classicism um, and it was promoted as the um, origin of entire European civilization. So it got to be independent from the Muslim Turks. Um, so to some extent, the entire Europe can kind of support that Greek independence. Um, Greek independence was not achieved until 1830, but throughout the 18th century, uh, people would use Greek architecture as a symbol of democracy, right? You know, classical Greece was democratic and now 18th century Greece was fighting for its freedom representing the kind of a uh, the rise of democracy. So Greek architecture and archeo when archeologists archeolo were allowed to go there to, to work on those classical ruins and they discover those white marble. And uh, they didn't know at that time that those you know, Parthenon used to be painted colorfully as shown here in this building. What they discover is pure mar marble, white. And that white marble, that pure white classical architecture became a symbol of independence, became a symbol of freedom and a symbol of democracy. So as a result, um, we know that um, in the 18th century, that was also um, you know, another great event in the new world is the American revolution, right? The independence of the United States from the British Empire. So United States, um, you know, fighting for its own independence, just like Greece was doing in Europe, adopted that white marble classicism as a symbol of freedom, independence, and democracy. So as a result, most of the governmental building in the in the United States are built in the style of you know, 18th century classicism, especially following those, using those, the white marble. Um, so the uh, most famous example, of course, is the uh, Capitol, right? US Capitol, it's just white. And you go to different state, you find kind of the same style, um, the, the capital for Pennsylvania, the capital for Rhode Island, uh, Etc. They were all kind of designed and built in the in the same style. Uh, most of them are in the it, it were built in the 19th, 19th century, but uh, the 18th century classicism um, was the major source for and major source of both style and symbolism for American governmental architecture. So. Um, <clears throat> There was also a very influential publication in the 18th century <clears throat> that reflect the new um, uh, il, uh, spirit of the uh, Enlightenment. Uh, that is Marc Antoine uh, Loger. Uh, Loger was a Jesuit priest, not an architect. However, even a Jesuit priest, an amateur architectural theorist, um, ha had the spirit of Enlightenment. His essay on architecture heralds the modern uh, by dissociating architectural theory from authority of Vitruvius and classical antiquity and um, grounding its um, <clears throat> fundamental principles on, um, you know, on the kind of direct observation of nature. Um, so he tried to define the most important principle for true architecture, for beauty in architecture. He said, quote, all the splendor of architecture ever conceived have been modeled on the little rustic hut. 
it is by approaching the simplicity of this first model that fundamental mistakes are avoided and a true perfection is achieved. Let us keep to the simple and the natural. It is the only road to beauty. So here, natural, right? Natural was given new meaning, right? Um, because nature was such a great inspiration uh, and uh, natural now got its new meaning. Natural is good. Natural is not, it, it might be primitive, it might be simple, but it is the, the model. It is something um, foundational kind of to be followed in order to achieve true architectural beauty. And uh, uh, in the Francis piece, um, Loger uh, had this illustration showing the goddess of architecture pointing to the, uh, the rustic hut. Now that rustic hut in architecture got its new meaning. It means the origin. It means the true origin of architecture. It is, it is good. It is natural, it is simple, but it is fundamental, it is good. So that little um, rustic hut illustrated here bear great resemblance to, to Greek temple, right? Two pillar, a pediment. That's a Greek temple. Uh, that's, um, that's, that's Parthenon. Basically, Parthenon is just a more elaborate version of this little rustic hut. So I think it's not accidental. The illustration reflect the 18th century ideal of our, about architecture. It's, a, it's kind of classical classicism. And uh, um, he, uh, so the, the admiration of nature um, can be found in multiple 18th century writers' writings. Uh, Jean-Jacques uh, Jean Rousseau uh, in his uh, seminal work, Discourse on Inequality also uh, said, um, you know, the, you know, highlight reason, right? You know, one need to, to follow reason and um, also nature is the source for truth, not only in science and the technology, but also in human society. He believed that human society needs to be equal um, because he said, there is hardly any inequality in the state of nature, right? So we find this kind of same emphasis um, in the 18th century uh, on reason on nature. So let's come back to um, Loger. Uh, Loger, his great work of essay on architecture. So he had, he had a very specific criticism to the current condition of architecture and he was pointing to new direction of, of architecture. He was trying to define um, the true, what he called true principle. And um, he believed that the true principle are independent of mental habit and human prejudice because they are based on nature. Right? Um, these principles can be discovered in the building of the noble savage. And this is another very important concept and a very important concept in 20th century modernism as well. So natural rustic hut, noble savage, they all acquired positive meaning uh, in, you know, after Lo Jay. And we can still observe that phenomena in the design by Le Corbusier, for example, the image of noble savage in his kind of a uh, brutalism design. So, um, and uh, in that, you know, he also contrasts that noble savage with those corrupted culture. Culture can be corrupted and one needs to return to that simple origin, 
for new inspiration, for truth. Um, so he tried to define what is essential and what is you know, being capricious. So let's take a look at what he is criticizing. Um, he criticized the pilaster. Right. For Loge, pilasters are fake because they are only poor representation of column. They must be regarded as a bizarre inven uh, innovation tolerated only by habit, in no way founded on nature or authorized by any need. Right. So he was criticizing you know, of course, we find pilaster uh, since since early Renaissance. Um, you know, in in Alberti's building, right? We have pilaster, and the pilaster was used in in Baroque architecture as well. But for Loge, those are those are wrong, and this is a direct. Uh, herald to uh, Adolf Luz, who proclaimed that all ornamentations are evil, are crime. So um, these are ornamentation. These are not necessary and thus need to be, um, you, you know, need to be cleansed uh, from the architectural image. Uh, <clears throat> so he also talked about uh, in tablature, he said, in, in tablature must always rest on its column like a lintel, never on miserable arches. And of course, we know, you know, by this statement, he was not only criticizing, you know, Baroque uh, in uh, Renaissance, but also Roman. We know that Roman arch is basically putting a entablature above an arch. Um, so for Loge, that was not also not uh, necessary. Uh, you know, and this is rational thinking. Yes, they are not necessary in terms of load bearing for those architectural members. You have an arch, you don't need that lintel, right? You don't need the lintel. So um, that is something, you know, the uh, Loge was, you know, was was quite um, quite strong felt strongly about, and then he talked about pediments. He said pediments represent the gable of the roof and therefore can never be anywhere except across the width of a building. So he's saying, you know, if you have a pediment, it must be across the whole building. Um, you know, above columns, and, and that's okay. Um, otherwise, you know, you if you have a pediment like this, that is not necessary. So that pediment, it does not represent, um, it is not across the whole uh, length of the building. Why did he say that? He said, um, you know, pediment um, if they are not across the whole building, especially if they are broken, they suggest a, um, a half open roof. So for a pediment like that, it is suggesting behind it, the roof is half open, it's broken in the middle because for Loge, pediment is valid only if it is covering the roof, right? That's a pediment. It, it is suggesting a true roof behind it and across the whole width of the building. So that is okay. And that is probably okay too, because it is across that pavilion uh, sticking out of that building. But something like that is wrong, right? It's a, it is, it represents caprice, not, not, not uh, you know fundamental. Um, he also made criticism to recent complete recently completed building. He said nothing is more absurd 
than to pile pediments on top of each other. The facade of St. Gervais has two roofs on over the other. I do not believe that a sensible person could approve of a double pediment. And this is St. Gervais. Um, you know, the building was there for a long time. And in the, in the 17th century, it was kind of two churches was, was combined into one and given a single facade. So that facade was completed in 1657. Um, and uh, it got those uh, double pediment, one pediment on top of the other. Uh, so for Loge, uh, only a senseless person would build like, build like that. And of course, piling up pediment was everywhere in Baroque style architecture. We see it in the English Baroque by Christopher Wren. We see it in the Italian Baroque, um, you know, by Bernini, Borromini, uh, etc. So he was, you know, criticizing the recent Baroque, popular popularized in the in the seventeenth century. Um, so he had a target, and his criticism was giving direction to a new classical revival, um, and his writing was so powerful and so influential that architect uh, like Soufflot um, and his design uh, for the St. Genevieve, uh, popularly known as the Parisian Pantheon, uh, completed in just before, um, uh, you know, just uh, um, uh, before the revolution, um, just before the, 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 the French Revolution and um, um, was cautiously, cautiously avoiding what was being criticized by, uh, by Loger. So this is um, the um, Pantheon in Paris uh, or St. Genevieve. Um, it was designed it was designed in a Greek cross shape, Greek cross, um, but highlighting centralized, you know, ceiling um, and also elevating a great dome in the fashion of the uh, St. Peter's. So if we compare <coughs> uh, Soufflot's facade with Christopher Wren's facade, we notice you know, today we might see the look so similar, you know, after many centuries, but in the 18th century, they are very different. This one for uh, the believers of, of Loge represent the true principle of architecture and um, St. Paul's Cathedral facade represent Capris. And let's try to understand uh, you know, what Soufflot was trying to do and what he was trying to avoid. Because, you know, what we, whatever we are arguing about today, you know, 200 years from now, um, people might feel, you know, we are arguing about something that is totally trivial, totally un unimportant at all. But, you know, studying history give us that perspective. You know, we, we know, you know, what we are, you know, what you know, our contemporary debate and, um, and try to understand the history, um, you know, what they were uh, debating about. So if you look at, compare these two, they share a lot of similarity. You know, their, uh, the central dome looks almost identical. And both of them looks like the uh, Invalid um, by uh, Monsard in, in Paris. And both of them also kind of look like St. Peter's uh, Cathedral, that dome designed by Michelangelo. Uh, both of them have very tall drum and uh, the tall drum had a second uh, drum. And on that second drum, a dome was was elevated and those dome had 
Lantern Pavilion. However, a significant difference um, in Suflo's design that pediment is across the whole width of the building, right? And um, which is not the case for Ren. And um, there is also no coupling of columns, right? Those columns are singular instead of having those coupling. And in Ren's facade, those pilaster give that great kind of verticality to the facade. While in Suflo's design, the pilaster, you know, uh, you might say, you know, these are pilaster, but they are not used as, as strongly as in uh, Christopher Wren's Baroque design. And also um, there's no piling up of pediment and there's no broken pediment. And in Wren's design, there are, you know, um, you know, in the tower, you know, there are pediment and there are kind of a, um, you know, lintels, horizontal load bearing members piling up one on top of the other. And there are also broken um, entablature, like in this case. And, you know, those are curved and uh, uh, dissected and reconnected, uh, etc. So all those were um, cleansed from the facade by Suflo. So what's, what are seemingly very similar to facades. In reality, there were very self-conscious design in the 18th century trying to, um, to, to create a facade that representing the true principle of architecture as being understood at the time. And, and uh, Loger was a major source for that conception about the true architecture. So <clears throat> the building, um, you know, after a revolution, it, it became basically the tomb for those great, um, great heroes um, of Paris, of France. Um, for example, Napoleon's sarcophagus was here as well. So it's, it became known as a pantheon um, for, for that reason. Uh, but originally that was, that was a church, right? And it's a uh, St. Genevieve church. Uh, so it, it combined the Greek cross, a central dome, and a temple pediment, right? A temple pediment. However, to achieve that simplicity, to achieve that uh, appearance of pure classical architecture, um, Suflo used a very advanced knowledge in the 18th century great engineering scientific knowledge. Uh, the quest to rationalize architecture following mathematical calculation of mechanical laws to determine the minimal structure needed to support the building. So in order to achieve that kind of simplicity in such a scale larger than most classical temple, one need uh, to uh, acquire uh, the maximum load bearing with the minimum amount of supporting material. And uh, Suflo invented machines to test the strength of building material to decrease the amount of material to be used. He also employed an innovative system of reinforced masonry to achieve light lightness and structural clarity. For example, the seemingly pure continuous lintel above column and with the large pediment across the whole width of the building was achieved actually by combining arches using arch to support that pediment and also use metal to um, integrate those stone blocks and all those arches and metals were hidden behind the 
marble and to give it a, an appearance as if this is a horizontal lintel. In reality, it also has multiple arch inside to make it light and to give it strength, right? So here we are looking at two very different things, but both reflected 18th century spirit. On the exterior image, classicism as defined by theorists like Loger and in actual structure, it is, it reflects the 18th century um, kind of a revolu revolution in engineering, in industry that provided those technological support to lighten the weight of the roof. And that true engineering innovation was carefully uh, hidden behind a classical veneer. So we see on one hand, there is an ideal on architectural image. On the other hand, there is a true innovation in, in architectural technology and architectural technology is, is often um, being hidden after the aesthetic preference. And this phenomena, the kind of a contrast and uh, uh, kind of struggle between engineering and architecture uh, is characterizing the entire modern movement and down to the current age. So today we still will see the same phenomena um, that, you know, trying to achieve some, a certain type of architectural image and um, um, the innovative uh, technological and structural element were, were made hidden as if they were ugly, as if they were, you know, kind of a destroying the architectural image. And this phenomena can be more clearly observed in the following 19th century uh, in buildings like the Eiffel Tower. So the interior of um, St. Genevieve um, has also three layers of roof. We know that Christopher Wren's St. Paul has that, right? So there is a middle layer, upper layer, lower layer, and the lower layer has an oculus and the middle layer had a window. So the light come through and the upper layer create a tall image uh, so that the, the dome can be seen, right? So basically, um, you know, that is the, um, the another um, famous example of those triple layer of dome. Um, initiated by uh, Mozart in his Invalid um, Church in, in Paris. So the interior had a um, marvelous sense of, of lightness. Uh, so he achieved something that is, that is light and uh, bright like those Gothic architecture. However, he also um, maintained horizontality and the um, purity and the simplicity like, the, like those in, in, in Greek architecture. So he achieved something, um, you know, the structural integrity um, and, and the, the large windows that allows, you know, bright light to filter into the interior is, is very similar to Gothic building, but the purity and magnif magnificence um, is similar to Greek architecture. And that was feasible only um, because he used innovative, innovative um, method of kind of lightening the weight of the roof. Um, so, in St. Genevieve, uh, Soufflot achieved a synthesis of the tributed system of Greek, Greek architecture and um, the structural clarity of Gothic above it. 
So everywhere you feel it is kind of a post and lintel, right? You have consistent lintel supported by, by posts. Uh, but then above it, you have a great sense of ample space and uh, those large uh, glazed windows that is characteristic of Gothic. So now let's turn to the other aspect, the aspect of industrial um, flowering that was considered ugly in architecture in the 18th century and the 19th century. So architecture um, used to consider something like this, pure utilitarian and engineering. It is not architecture, right? So something like this had been constructed in the 18th century. And it created a great span that cannot be achieved by stone. Yet the um, uh, conservative definition of architecture would consider this not non-architecture. Uh, and uh, so we can see this contrast and uh, in um, those engineering work like this. And uh, we can understand better why Suflo need to hide his engineering uh, innovation behind the classical veneer. So that, but that engineering breakthrough inspired great Im imagination in architecture. And 18th century was also the beginning of um, kind of a uh, architectural education. The French Academy, British Academy were founded in the 18th century and they sent students to Rome to study those classical ruins. So the famous Rome prize for the, for the French Academy um, brought a large amount of architectural students to Rome and Rome uh, became the holy center for classical revival. Everyone who wanted to study true architecture needed to come to Rome to observe um, those classical ruins. So artists like um, Giovanni uh, Battista Piranesi uh, found that profitable. He, was, he created all kinds of prints and sell them to those tourists, to those architectural student and made a profit. And some of his prints were truthful. So these are all prints made by um, Piranesi. Classical ruins like the uh, Colosseum, um, like the Republican, um, Repu you know, Republican Fora. And um, uh, so these, these are kind of truthful or, you know, Hadrian's tomb. Um, so these were sold to those tourist and architectural students who came to Rome to study architecture. But he also created those kind of a imagined uh, architectural space. And those imagined architectural space combined classical images from classical ruin with kind of industrial element. You know, you see those huge uh, metal letters and metal parts and bridges uh, connecting those uh, masonry arches. And a lot of them are seemingly uh, dilapidated. So he created these, um, <clears throat> you know, very picturesque and um, um, uh, very often uh, featuring a grand scale. So the human figures in these images are tiny and uh, combining those industrial utopia with the classical admiration, um, the, the kind of admiration of classical um, ruins. Um, something like this, um, right? So the, those structures are seemingly above the cloud, suggesting grand scale. So there was a kind of a new imagination of architecture, um, uh, highlighting uh, the power of the brain, power of the vision, not directly depicting what is existing, but projecting what might be, um, what might have been existed, right? And uh, that is something we call it visionary, right? So Piranesi um, uh, helped to kind of trigger people's imagination power about architecture, uh, something 
might not be constructible, might not, not be achievable right now, but you know, it doesn't hurt to, to create the image of that. And that is very powerful. And uh, that is called a visionary. And um, uh, which started to draw people's attention to a different aspect of, of architecture that eventually uh, resulted in those more architectural person like Ledoux and Boulay, Boulay right? So the Ledoux and Boulay um, are the 18th century French architect that are classified by, uh, by their vision. Um, and they are kind of uh, influenced by classical elements highlighting purity, highlighting horizontality, but there was also a vision in it. Um, and um, Ledoux and Boulay also um, draw people's attention to the profession of architect. Um, you know, architect was someone who was shouldering great social responsibility um, who was not just a building, but was responsible for achieving a better society. And that utopian idea were also kind of materialized in architect like Boulay and, and, and Ledoux. Um, so this is a um, image drawn by, by Boulay. Let's first take a look at Ledoux. Uh, Ledoux built more. You know, Boulay was a pure visionary architect. He didn't build anything, he just draw. Uh, but his drawing, like Piranesi's drawing, was influential. And Ledoux um, did actual construction. So this is his um, partially completed, the thought work of Arc and Sinans in 1773. So um, Ledoux, you know, you know, is another very important um, figure that helped to elevate the status of architect uh, secondary only to Alberti. You know, Alberti elevated architecture to intellectual, to an intellectual um, discipline. And Ledoux elevated architecture and architect to become a master of society. Um, so he believed that architect was to oversee principle. He can activate the resource of industry husband its products and avoid costly maintenance. He can augment the treasury by means of the uh, by, uh, by means of the uh, prodigal compositions of his his art. So his um, thought work um, was designed in great geometry, reflecting the kind of neoclassical principle and also reflecting the uh, utopian ideal about those grand diagram uh, Im implicated in large scale. It is also greatly similar to Jeremy um, Bentham's Panopticon, right? Panopticon, drawn and designed by um, a philosopher Bentham was a prison design. The main idea is like this. If you design a semicircular building, you put a tower in the middle. The tower has a small window. And uh, the person inside the central tower cannot be seen from outside or very hard to be seen from outside. But you design the, the cell of the prison that are all open to the center those prisoners behavior would be automatically um, kind of a um, principled. And even, there, even if there is no person, no guard in that central tower, the prisoner would behave uh, principled, right? So that became a very powerful metaphor about surveillance, the hidden gaze no matter whether there is a person originating that gaze or not, would create a disciplining power for those that were exposed 
those to be observed. So he draw this prisoner facing an empty central observation tower and kneeling there, um, repenting. So um, Ledoux's thought work, he designed in the center administration and around the, the surrounding edge, those are the storage. And that is a powerful um, example for Bentham's panopticon, all right? So those observation gaze, no matter whether there is a person or not, would help to elevate the surveillance of those storage. Uh, and he uh, kind of a, used this classical circle and square to, to accomplish that. And these are, this, this is the, um, the director's um, house, right, in the, in the center, the house of the director. Uh, and the gate is right here in front of the house of the director. And the, gaze, uh, the gate has symbolism uh, depicting the function of the thought work facility. And um, so he used classical motif, but used in a, in a very simplistic way and combining with new industrial symbolism. Um, this is a section of the gate uh, showing the grotto and architectural work uh, just after that porch. So industry here replace those classical statue representing God and a goddess and um, was sheltered in a, a temple-like uh, structure with, you know, if this is a, a Etruscan or Roman temple, you know, that would, that is a porch and this would be, you know, the, the divine figure. So another of his design, this one is totally not completed. Um, it's just on paper. Um, this is the ideal town of Shaw and you can see the same combination of utopian, classicism, 18th century rationalism, and uh, Bentham's panopticon. Right. So I'm not going to uh, explain this, but I highlight these key um, idea and the key idea of the significance in, in this work. So a lot of symbolism, so he designed, you know, the house for the park gar guards like an idol. He designed the house for the keeper of a river dam uh, like a dam. And this one is a brothel. And I, you know, I think everyone can see what, what that is. Now, um, let's move on to um, Boulay. Boulay is a pure kind of visionary um, architect. So he helped to define a very important element in architecture. That is architecture is beyond the physical form. He asked, what is architecture? And his answer is architecture is conception. You conceive, right? And he highlighted the power of the mind, the process of creation. And he believed construction is merely an auxiliary art, right? You know, achieving a physical structure, that is, that is secondary uh, to the creation, uh, the process of creation. So let's see, take a look what, at what he created on paper. So this is his design for the uh, cenotaph for Newton. He acclaimed the Newton. He said, oh, Newton, with the range of your intelligence and the sublime nature of your genius, you have defined the shape of the earth. I have conceived the idea of enveloping you in your discovery, right? So uh, Newton defined the universe and uh, Boulay defined Newton. Uh, so here his design is a enormous um, dome and that dome is a complete uh, ball, complete, um, you know, complete ball um, uh, once you are inside. And that dome represents the sky. And during the daytime, the interior is 
is night because those bright night, bright light filter into the small aperture in the ceiling and appear like stars and moons. And during when outside is night, the interior is day. So he imagined those great uh, light um, fueled by the new discovery, um, uh, industrial discovery. He imagined that one might need to illuminate the interior like day bright and uh, shows a daytime um, scene of the universe. Um, and here we, again, we see kind of the classical circle square, those classical form, but here it is combined with visionary um, projection and its scale is suggested by the tiny um, scale of those trees and the human figures. Human figures are basically um, not describable because they are so tiny, so small compared to this grand scale. So that vision was inspired partially by um, the invention of the balloon, all right? The balloon, a new invention in the 18th century that allowed people to rise in the air and to have a panoramic observation of the earth on which human figure looks like ants, like tiny little ants. And those real vision would, ima would um, give imagining power for those visionary architects like, like, like Boulay. Right? Um, so let's take a look at some of his other design. This is his design for, for library. So for Boulay, you know, architecture is like a poetry. It also communicate meaning and those um, communication of meaning is uh, connected to the function of the building and also um, poetic. Uh, so um, the libraries, you can see the walls are basically bookshelves um, and uh, it is designed pretty much like a basilica, right? It's a basilica space, a sacred space in the classical architecture, but now it was replaced by the new uh, the vibration of knowledge, of, of you know, knowledge from, from nature. Um, uh, from the uh, observation analysis of, of nature and the natural power. Again, the scale is enormous, right? So you can see the tiny human figure. And this is his design for uh, cemetery. And um, so here we start to see the, the kind of, kind of uh, um, you know, combination of different style, not necessarily just uh, the narrow definition of classical, but, uh, you know, Egyptian, uh, e Egypt, um, archaeologists tells us Egyptian tomb was, you know, 5,000 year old. So those pyramid was perfect symbol for cemetery. So he designed those enormous pyramid, um, pyramidal shape for the entrance to a cemetery. A stadium and of course, you know, Colosseum, right? So using stadium, uh, the, the image of Roman uh, Colosseum for the design of stadium. And again, it is enormous. Um, look at that human figure, right? Um, or museum. So museum now occupies the status of a temple in classical world. Museum is a modern temple. Uh, we go to museum just like the uh, ancient uh, Greeks and Romans going to a temple. And indeed, museum, museums are designed like a temple. And uh, Boulay proposed that a museum is a temple of fame for statues of the great man. Um, his design, I should say, you know, looks very simplistic. And some might say this is, this is the beginning of kind of a classic modernism, like what we can see in uh, Le Corbusier or Walter Gropius, I think that is a misconception because the, 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 the kind of a seemingly um, simplicity was a result of the great scale. It is just because the scale is too, too big 
So you don't see those classical detail. And in, in reality, there are classical detail everywhere in Boulet's drawing. It is simply because it is so big and he didn't use those classical detail to cover everywhere, only cover the entrance and the lower and upper part that make it looks kind of a uh, simple and, 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 and a square, right? Looks like those kind of 20th century um, kind of modernist architecture. In fact, um, that was not, I don't think that is intentional, right? So you, you can see there are, they are full of classical details. It is simply because of the great scale that rendered it appearing um, like a kind of a cubist um, simplicity. So probably the closest actual um, architectural construction to Boulay's visionary architecture was the, uh, the Nazi uh, Germany building by Albert Speer, uh, the architect for uh, Adolf Hitler. So he designed, for example, this Cathedral of Light in Nuremberg, um, the capital for the Third Reich in 1936. So it's enormous, it's classical. It seems simplistic, but the simplicity was the result of large scale. And that was used to activate the Nazi forces uh, to conquer the world. And uh, he imagined something even bigger, uh, the Great Hall, um, you know, Hitler directly participate in the, in the design of it with the help of Albert Speer. So the model was made, but uh, um, it was never built and uh, the Third Reich uh, collapsed. Um, at the end of the Second World War. But it was designed to hold 180 people and its dome rose 290 meter high and with a diameter of 250 meter. Give you a sense, you know, Pantheon, the largest span ever seen before the 20th century is 46 meter. So you can put nine, panth uh, you can put five uh, Pantheon dome in just along its diameter, right? So that's, that's the actual Pantheon uh, in Rome. And this is the dome for the Great Hall. So Hitler uh, liked to say that the purpose of his building was to transit his time and his spirit to posterity, ultimately, all that remained to remind man of the great epoch of history was their monumental architecture. Uh, this is a quote from Albert Speer, the um, kind of a court architect for Hitler. 